Let me just say one other thing that might not be popular. I have a tendency to do this. I don't think it's very constructive to go places and say only what people agree with and, and want to hear. Maybe this won't be. But I think a very significant problem with our movements is that um, uh, they, they, they embody a set of values and norms which, whatever the motivation may be, come across as anti-working class, come across as uncongenial to working people participating. There's a lot of ways to think about this. I mean, the obvious way to think about it is exactly the parallel to the question that was asked earlier. If we have movements that are racist and sexist internally, that says to blacks and Latinos and women that the movement is sort of hostile to them. If, our, if we swash their aspirations and their culture inside our organizations, well, we do that to working people. We create movements and organizations whose internal structure pays zero attention to our rhetoric about improving the lot of working people because it replicates the structures which cause their lot to be horrible. Right? So that's the first way that this happens. But there are more ways that this happens. For instance, um, the way that we, I won't even take the hand wave, but the way that we don't just individually not watch sports, right? but the way that we get a gut, visceral, hostile reaction to people watching or participating in sports. Right? <laughs> The way that we do that around religion. We are in the most sports conscious and the most religious country in the world. It is a little like, it is a little like if you were going to go to France and be an organizer but not speak French. <laughs> it's not wise. Not if you want to win. Now, if the reason that you're going to French to organize is because you like the other organizers in France and you don't give a shit about reaching the French public, okay, no need to speak French. Right? <laughs> But if the reason that you're organizing in the United States is not to feel good about ourselves that we're moral or to fight the good fight, right? but who cares if we win? I, the, the slogan, fight the good fight, is for instance, I mean, I find few things that, bra I mean, you know, maybe some of you get nauseous about football. I get nauseous about fight the good fight. Because it says, you know, who cares if we win? We'll just fight the good fight. Well, the fucking people who are suffering care if we win, right? And I care if we win. And if we're, not trying to, if we're not trying to win, what are we doing? Go to the goddamn beach. I never understand these people. If they're, if they're not trying to win, enjoy yourself a little bit more, you know? So, so, so that, that's a key aspect. And, and the extent to which we are not just... So, for instance, I went to um, state... Co uh, uni State College in Pennsylvania, as people heard me say this last night. There are other examples, but this one is just so striking. A room with 300 people, all radicals. I could have picked 280 of them out walking around the campus. That's how much like each other they looked and how much <laughs> unlike the rest of the campus they looked. Now, you know, I look that way too, but at, at some point we have, once upon a time, right? And maybe I still, we have to understand something. It, on that campus, each Saturday, Everybody goes to the football game, except the 300 people in that room. <laughs> really. I asked people to raise their hands. How many people had been to a football game? Right? Three people, all black, raised their hands. The whole rest of the room, no. And they were all laughing, because, of course, they thought that in the beginning of my talk, I was pointing out how wonderful they were, that they managed to rise above the horrible you know, lifestyle and, and degenerate morality of their brethren on the campus. So then I said, you know, on the way here this morning, I passed a sports bar. This huge bar in downtown State College. State College has a population of maybe 60,000. The stadium holds 80,000. And every Saturday, there's 80,000 people in it. That should tell you something. You know, the, the po football is this town. So you go past this sports bar. Well, this thing wasn't really unusual for me. I mean, it was a huge bar. It was full of talking people, and they were big. I mean, there, there isn't a single person in this room, I think, who would have looked in place, even if they were dressed exactly like the people in that bar. These people were athletes. I mean, these people were huge. The women were big. The men were big. Everybody in the goddamn place was, uh, was intimidating in some sense. So I came into the, in that sense, right? I came into the thing, I said, after I did the football thing, I said, look, how many of you people have been down to the sports bar to organize? The whole room bursts into hysterics. Right? They're all laughing, and they think I'm making a joke. Right? Meanwhile, if you don't organize the people in that sports bar, go to the beach. 
because you're not organizing the campus of, the, of, you're not, what are you doing? That's the whole student body, right? How can you possibly write that off, right? And, and I honestly think if we ask what it is that we're writing off, oftentimes it's we're writing off working class culture and values and styles, which might be very disturbing, but if you think about it, what kind of music do we write off and what kind is acceptable? What kind of, you know, McDonald's is unacceptable. Why is McDonald's unacceptable? You know, is it unacceptable because it's a multinational or is it unacceptable because working people eat there, right? With good reason, right? Not with bad reason. They don't eat there to get sick, right? They're not morons, <laughs> right? They eat there because it's inexpensive and it's actually not poison, <laughs> right? And so on. So I think that it's important for us to, to, that doesn't mean McDonald's shouldn't be a target for us. Yes, but it has more than one way to make it a target. Right? There's more than one way to talk about it. Every working class guy who watches football in the <laughs> afternoon knows that those people earn you know, more on Saturday than he or she earns in you know, two years. It isn't just us who know that. They're not stupid. They know that. They also know, you know, but we might know that about the tennis player. Or the, you know, but we're okay watching that. <laughs> but it's no good to watch the football. But it's okay to watch the tennis. Or it's okay to watch... It's okay to go to the symphony, but it's not okay to go to the, the hootenanny. What's the most popular sport in the United States, the most popular spectator sport? Auto racing. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, auto racing. And how many of you even know what an auto race is? Yeah. You know, not very, well, some. That's more than most places. Huh? Yeah. I mean, these things... Now, am I saying that every person on the left has to be religious, sports fanatic, and into TV, you know, in a profoundly... Way so they can talk. No, I'm not saying that. But, but notice what the reality is. It isn't that, I'm not saying every person has to. I'm saying look around. Nobody is. <laughs> right? It's not just personal preferences, it's a, st it's a style. Right? And it's a style that is destructive of our capacity to reach out. Go ask any black organizer what they think of a white organizer who simply cannot talk about sports at all in the United States. You just, you know, watch your chin while you do it. Um, yeah. All right. Um, I agree with. A Stop lot there. Of Next person. <laughs> no. <laughs> Let, hear me out. I, I agree with some no, of the points you're right. evidently getting to, but like, fact of the matter is, like, uh, all right. I probably other people who are in a similar situation with me right now and are feeling this too. I don't drink. I don't like sports. I went to high school with a lot of athletic people. They made fun of me and called me a faggot, and like, those aren't my people. I don't want to like go into a sports bar just because that's where the people are, and I want to organize the people. Like, I want to go places where I feel comfortable, and like, those are my kind of people hanging out. And that might not be a sports bar. It's probably like a punk show or like an open mic poetry event, and like. I don't see what's wrong with that. Because well, but see, I didn't say class, anything was wrong with that. Working class people go there, too. Like, yeah. why is this emphasis being put on, like, sports bar? But I didn't say you should go to the sports bar for pleasure. You didn't hear me say that. I said you should go... Why should I go somewhere where I don't even, like... Because that's where the population is, and you want to win a revolution. The population is, is also, like, you know, at hardcore shows. Well, like... You know, the population is everywhere. Yeah, so but you, I you gave you the, well, you can, we can agree to disagree maybe, but look at State College and the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. There's 300 people in the room. You can, you can go through the campus and identify, you know, 280 of them as being in a cultural minority that is quite different. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there's something intrinsically wrong with that. But if those 300 people want to have the 30,000 people on that campus against war, they have to talk to the 30,000 people. Now, if they don't want to, don't. That's okay. But, but don't make believe that we want to have that. Let me give you an example of, of doing this. Let me just give you an example of doing this. Um, in, in, in the early 60s, well, you know, I have the mic. In the early 60s, in the early 60s, because um, I'm not here most of the time. In the early 60s, um, at MIT, the demonstrators around the war, the Vietnam War, were, most people at MIT didn't even know there was a Vietnam War, right? so it's just completely. 
the people at MIT who are related to the Vietnam War are at Harvard, at Boston University, who related to the Vietnam War demonstrations, which were small rallies on the Boston Common in 1965, 1966, 1967. Right? The people who went down went down to throw rocks at the demonstrators. Right? That's what they went for. By 1968 and 1969, those campuses were all anti-war. Now that happened because what? Because people in those campuses who were organizers right, said, we're going to talk to everybody. At MIT, what we did is we said, we, we got together our organizations and we began to start and we said, how are we going to get this whole campus to be anti-war? Which was quite a daunting project because these people were people who, A, were oblivious to any of these kinds of issues and B, thought everything that was going on in the world was for the benefit of everybody. Right? I mean, uh, just the, the level of, of lack of understanding. Oh, wait a second. Here's what we did. We said... The guy who is the president of the interfraternity conference has the same genes we do. The guy has the same human nature we do. The guy has bad values now, but he can be talked to. Let's go talk to him. Let's go talk to the person who does the football team. It's basically a male college. I mean the basketball team. Let's go talk to these various people who have hundreds of friends and hundreds of acquaintances. Let's organize them. Let's simultaneously go into the dorms and into all these other places. We weren't going into places where we were comfortable. Right? We weren't going into places where they had our values. Of course, they didn't have our values. Most importantly, they didn't have our value about the war. Right? But they didn't have other of our values, too. And that wasn't where we went to have fun. We also had a movement that tried to give us some sustenance and fun and pleasure, and that tried to fulfill our aspirations. But when we were organizing, we went out to talk to the people who needed to be reached. But the point I'm trying to make is, like, is why should you go like to to somewhere where like you have nothing in common like with the people who are there when instead you should be like going back to your own community and starting like and starting organizing with people you relate to well, instead of like it depends if your own community look if the situation was that your own community so to speak at State College in, in, in Pennsylvania or wherever. Here, here. If your own community. Even from State College. Okay, but if your own community. But that's the exam. If like your why, own. Why would they come to a sports bar like one night when they came from places like Baltimore and Pittsburgh and Philadelphia? Like, I don't understand what you're trying to make. Baltimore, Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia are like State College. No, they're I mean, not. Well. What are you talking about? Well, okay. See, I think they are. And I think that, that you. That they are. Um, and, and, that, and there's nothing wrong with large it. Large metropolitan cities. Yes, there are large metropolitan cities in which a huge proportion of the population is religious, is watches TV, is into sports, is has a whole kind of has various life attributes. Homogenizing these communities, like, and, and making them sort of. All, I, didn't, all I, I didn't homogenize anything. I just said that people. I mean, if you don't think that's true, okay, we disagree on the fact. Yeah. I'm curious, like, getting back to economics. Okay. Um, <laughs> I just wonder if you visualize, like, when we were talking about, like, the 20% and then the 80%, yeah. and I can see how, like, if people become more educated about what a true reform would mean, that people in the 80% would want that. But do you see that, like, there's really a nonviolent way of having the people in the 20% lose that power? First off, when, when, when people ask that question, the answer is no. But, but in the following, but don't rush. The answer is no, because we already have violence. How could there be a nonviolent way forward when we already have gargantuan amounts of violence, even just in the United States? So if you look at the lot of, of people who live in, in you know, black communities and Latino communities and so working class people, right, they already face repressive violence. So surely there will be violence. Now the question is, the, the, the second part of the question is, well, will the 20% be convinced? Right. Or will the capitalists be convinced? And therefore, on one, on one nice day, say, shit, what have I been doing right, over a period of time? I mean, this seriously. You know, I can see how it is both just and moral, and remarkably, it might even make my life more happy, and so I'm on your side. Will some people do that? Yes. Some people will. Will many people do that? No. No, I don't believe that. For a host of reasons, I, I do not believe that. And so I spend none of my time... right trying to organize and convince capitalists or coordinator class people. That doesn't mean that I don't think that a considerable number of people in this 20% will be on our side. And if I'm talking to one, of course I'm talking to them, right? But I don't think we should orient ourselves 
to convincing them, which is what we do largely. Right? And it's a big mistake because it says to the other 80% that they are dispensable, the same way everything says that to them, the same way all advertising says that to them. You know, if you have money, you count. If you don't, you, you know. So, and the left says that to them, too. We're only concerned about who reads the New York Times. You know. It's a mistake. But um, violence, the, the, when I was in my violent mode, I'm not a pacifist by any means. Right? By no means. And I've looked down the barrel of a gun you know, with somebody threatening my life and I, you know, all those kinds of things. So I'm not a pacifist and I have some experience, not a lot, but some experience of it. When I was in my more violent oriented stage, I used to say this to people. I used to say, we live in a country in which um, uh, if you turn the other cheek, they'll hit that one too. And that's true. If you lie down on the railroad tracks, they'll run you over. And so my deduction was, Right? We have to be willing to fight violence with violence. Well, I was right about those facts. The deduction was moronic. Right? And the reason the deduction was moronic is because there's no such thing as fighting capitalist state power there's no, by, by way of violence. There is no such thing as fighting the US Army or the US police departments. There is no such thing. There is no scenario which involves the U.S. populace picking up guns and defeating that. The only scenario that defeats that is if they put down guns. But notice, that isn't the 20% putting down guns. The 20% don't carry guns, right? It's the police and the army. If, if you want to know when we're really making headway, we're really, I mean, sports bar, huh? We, I, mean, I, I mean, if you want to know when we're really making headway, it's going to be when a serious decision in the life of some but an activist is, do I want to go join the police force? Do I want to go join the army to organize there? Right? Now, people did that in the 60s. You know, a lot of people went to Canada to escape the war in Vietnam or to, and to make a protest, which was good. Right? And not everybody is suited to all kinds of work. But there are other people who self-consciously went into the army in order to organize against the war. Those were the most courageous people, with possible exception of the people in parts of Chicago who tried to join the police force to organize inside the police force. Right? Th these are real things to do. Now, I don't think everybody should do it. I, I'm going to give the other side of my answer to you now. I knew people who, in those days, would, would say to themselves, what's the most important thing for me to do? What's the most productive thing to do? Well, the first problem is that that's a stupid question, because nobody knows the answer to that question. Right? How about Rosa Parks not moving from her chair in the bus? Can anybody predict, you know, remotely the impact of such a thing? No. You, you don't, there's no such thing as what's the most important. But okay, let's go along with it. The person would sort of list possible things to do. And maybe the top one was go into a working class community and be an organizer, right? In other words, find some way to live there, get a group of people to work with, make friends, et cetera, et cetera. Let's say that was the top. And you go down. And the person would look at that list and say, I'm a revolutionary. I care about changing the world. I should do the thing that's most important. I'll do that one. Right? They didn't look at themselves at all. They didn't ask, can I do that? Am I suited to do that? Am I a am I is my disposition such that I can make a life doing that? That I can smile ever doing that? Right? That I can be in for the long haul doing that? What we should really do is look at the array of possible things to do and look at ourselves and our inclinations. And find something over here that gives us enough of what we desire and enough of what makes us smiling people and positive people and able to communicate, you know, functional, and not instead of depressed and slowly burning out, and choose that. All right, that wasn't your actual question. So your actual question is, what's the, what's the, what's the response to that they have the guns? Um, the response to they have the guns is we have to have the people. And we have to have so many people that we create conditions under which the use of repression is more counterproductive to them than it is productive to them. What are we doing when we try and stop the bombing? It's, we're, not try, we're not educating George Bush that killing people in Afghanistan is a bad thing. You can spend from now until the year 4,000. You're not going to succeed. Right? He is never going to believe that. He doesn't even believe they're humans. Right? Yeah. I, I, don't get me started. But in any case, we're not going to do that. So what are we doing? We're saying to George Bush, if you pursue the end to the policy-making apparatus, if you pursue the policies, the result will be, and now a lot of people are saying things. In Europe, people are saying the result will be dissent here. In, in the Mideast, 
people are saying, not with the values that we hold, the, the, the result could be the fall of Saudi Arabia and so on. In other words, there are, there are ramifications. We're saying here the result will be the emergence of more and more people who are against the war and then who are against the whole goddamn thing, the whole system behind the war. In, again, you know, my formative influence was, was the Vietnam War. Um, so I use that as an example and also because it's far enough in the past that we have a lot of information. When the war was on, after a time, after there were huge movements, Senators and Congress people and lawyers and, and, and you know, prominent citizens, in other words, members of that coordinator class, when they came to the conclusion that they didn't want to support the war anymore, they would often hold a press conference. That's the way they view themselves, you know, that, that important. So they would hold a press conference and they would explain why it is, you know, my, I can no longer in good conscience support the war in Vietnam. And then they would say why? They didn't say, I can no longer in good conscience support the war in Vietnam because it's killing a, a million, actually two or three million Indo-Chinese people. Right? They didn't say that. They didn't say, I can't support it because we're dropping plastic um, toys right, in trees which explode. And when they explode, they push their shrapnel into the arms and the bodies of the kids. And we make them in plastic so that they won't be able to find them with x-rays so that it will burden their infrastructure. I can no lo- they don't say, I can no longer support the war because only the devil could have a, a brain that would come up with that tactic, i.e. our government. Right? They don't say that. They don't even say, I no longer support the war because I can no longer support the death of American GIs. Because they don't give a fuck about the death of American GIs. The only way they care about that is if there's no more to take their place. What they say is, and you can go back and look for yourself, what they say is, I can no longer support the war because our streets are in turmoil, because we are losing the next generation. Because, what are they saying? They're saying, I can no longer support the war because although the war has aspects and ramifications that I do support, it has this side effect. And the side effect is the growing dissent, which is beginning to threaten what I hold even more dear, right? my elite position, my, the whole system. That's what had the power. And that tells us something about our organizing, like single-issue people versus multi-issue people. Right? Why is multi-issue the right answer? The right, it's the right answer because we're trying to raise social costs to these folks. Because a single-issue movement never reaches the, the magnitude to, to say to elites, you have to change, because it doesn't threaten what they really hold dear. Right? So the answer to the question is, at one point, we had a demonstration at MIT. They had, they had the National Guard on the roofs. They had machine gun nests. They had all this crap, right? And they had an injunction. This was all for intimidation, right? And some people would think they were going to use it. We knew they couldn't use it. Why? Because if they use it, the next day they'd have a half a million people instead of 100,000. Know, that's the condition you have to create. So they had these injunctions. You cannot appear. You cannot talk. You cannot do this. So we would get up in the most public place imaginable with all these people around, and we would tear up the injunctions. Why could we do that? It wasn't because we were courageous. It didn't take any courage at all. Because we had built a structure. In other words, we couldn't do that in San Antonio. If we had gotten up at that point in time in the exact same situation in San Antonio and ripped the thing up, they would have carried us off to jail, beating us to a pulp on the way. But we could do it there because we had big enough movements and enough consciousness that if they did that, it would cost them more than they would gain. That's how you fight repression. You create conditions under which it is, it is a useless tactic. If you don't do that, if all you do is get gas masks right, or shields or, or something like that, and you don't build support, you're going to lose. In the back. I think Richard mentioned the effect of anti-war protest by ending the draft. I'm not totally sure I'm hearing the question. You know, is what's the efficacy of trying? Huh? Nixon ending yeah. protest by ending the draft. Yeah. Well, trying to end the draft, it has its good side and it has its bad side. If you get rid of the draft, then the army becomes those people who can't get a job. If you have a draft, and it's a really universal draft, then the army includes the sons and daughters of the elite. So 
there's a sense in which ending the draft is not always even a progressive desire, right? Because it just puts more and more of the burden on the poor. And it reduces, so there's a sense in which, it, I didn't spend a whole lot of time fighting, you know, fighting against the draft. I fought against the war, and every war since. So um, if you can end the draft and you have a milieu in which nobody will go, then it's progressive, then it's positive. It just depends. It, but it's not, you can see how it could be problematic. Right? Um, are you saying we have to stop? Like the, the next thing you do at 1.30. <laughs> oh, it's 1.30. 12.30. Oh, it's 12.30. 12 All right, well, I don't... I, oh, wait, I do have to do something. <laughs> Are we okay if, I, if it goes on? Do we have to leave? No. Okay, I don't care. I'm perfectly happy to stay. But people who want to leave, for instance, to eat, I will certainly understand that. And the rest of you who are insane and want to stay and not eat, I'm happy to talk with you. Okay. Yeah, people who want to go should go, please, because some people do want to keep talking. The question was, in a participatory economy, if we're rewarding effort and sacrifice, what happens if somebody doesn't work? Or what happens to the person who doesn't work? Obviously, they're not, they're not putting forth any effort and sacrifice at work because they're not working. So how do they eat? Well, the answer is, if the reason they're not working is because they can't, you know, because of a health problem or something, then, I mean, even capitalism recognizes that problem, and obviously a participatory economy. So you, you remunerate effort and sacrifice and also need in the case where somebody can't work. But suppose somebody says, eh, I just don't want to work. I, I'd rather not contribute. I'd rather not exert any effort and sacrifice support me. Well, different, different participatory economies might have a different answer to that. Uh, one could say, um, OK, we'll have some minimum income that's guaranteed. Right? Another could say, fuck that. You know, why should somebody get to say, I don't, I don't have to do everything. The rest of us are working. Why should somebody get to say that? There's nothing wrong with work. It's equitable. It's fair. It's just. It's dignified. Why shouldn't they carry their share? Right? I might say that. So that is, I, in other words, that doesn't mean you don't get any vacations. It doesn't mean you don't get any time off. But the idea that somebody should just, you know, not work. Suppose we were all shipwrecked on an island tomorrow. That's a way to think about economics that's very good, I think, that's very constructive, because it takes a lot of the crap out. We're all shipwrecked on an island. So we come up on the island, what should we do? Well, one possibility is we hold a gigantic fight, right? And some people grab all the land and all the pineapples or the food, and from then on, they get almost everything and the rest of us work for them. Probably we'll come out against that. The next thing we could do is we could see people's prior training, their knowledge, and their skills, apportion tasks that way, and have some people get more again and some people, or we could do our way. But suppose we did it our way because we believe in those values and somebody raises their hand and says, hey, it's really great. We've set up a nice system. It's not exactly luxurious because we're on this friggin' island, right? But at least it's fair and it's equitable, but I don't want to work. Well, what are you going to say to that person? I'm going to say, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> right? You want me to do your work for you? Right? Why aren't you going to do your share? Now, if the person got hurt in the shipwreck, right, that's a different story. So that would be my answer. We might all decide that we want to have a norm whereby a person can eat and, and get a shelter and maybe get, you know, get some minimum amount, no matter what they do. Or we might not. And what about family structures and children and things? Like, it, There's no children in participatory economics. <laughs> <laughs> it's too I mean, complicated, so I decided to rule it out. <laughs> uh, I mean, how do you envision work giving, supplying families and children and not, you know, not yet eligible? Well, they're, they're like somebody on the island who can't work. So they get their share, just by virtue of need. I just wonder, like, logistically, how would that work? Well, it depends. I mean, there's a bigger question here. The bigger question is, we're doing this economic revolution. Well, what's happening over here in kinship and in the family? Is there, is there one happening there? See, I don't think that what we're going to have is participatory economics and the same kind of political system and the same kind of kinship system and the same kind of culture that we have now. So I think there'll be change there, too. And until we figure out what that change is, for example, suppose it was the case, as a hypothesis, that sexism is generated by women mothering and men fathering. In other words, not people parenting, but a demarcation of, of tasks and responsibilities into this thing called mother and this thing called father, which are dramatically different, and which men do one and men do the other. Suppose that's the case. Suppose that generates, suppose it, it 
it, it, it nurtures and produces sexism. So that when we then do affirmative action and all the rest of it, right, we are making nice changes, but we are leaving the cause. Right? Then we would want to change that. I think I'd want to change that. I think that's true, that that's part of the cause, and that that, that needs to be changed and addressed, but I don't have a good answer. But um, if we do all those things, then the answer to how kids get food is the same as the answer to how anybody else gets food. It's part of the planning process. The kids are too young to be part of the planning process when they're really kids, so the parents or the people who are responsible for them are, are doing it for them. Um. Um, what, about, what about when... Let's say, not that they don't want to work, but what they want to do isn't valued by the society or isn't valued by the system. Um, like, I think, I think maybe that's what that guy was trying to say about the innovation. Where oh, it's that is valued. Right, but let's say maybe he felt that it wouldn't be, or maybe there's stuff that isn't, va isn't valued now, but could be very... And you're, you're correct. I mean, it's a real issue. In other words, what, what, what is it that, that permits, in some sense of the word, something to be done in a good economy? People have to value it. You're right. But people are not stupid. So, for instance, suppose we ask about um, um, musical styles that are not yet popular. Nobody values them yet because nobody knows what the hell they are. But we're not morons. We know that, and, and who has to be convinced now? Right? Well, the owners of the music companies. You have to convince them to give you money to experiment. Or you have to convince some corporate, some board of a university or whatever. Right? In the new economy, what you have to do is you have to convince your, your fellow workers, your fellow composers, your fellow, you know, your, 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 your community of people in your industry. Right? Now, they have to convince the whole economy, but what are they saying to the whole economy? They're saying, do you like music? Do you like new music? You don't, they're not saying, do you like this particular experiment that nobody has heard yet? They're just saying, should we apportion a certain amount to innovative, innovative anything? Innovative air transport, innovative bicycles, innovative music, innovative research into science, etc. So, so, and there's no reason to think that normal people now, much less normal people with good educations who aren't dumbed down, who, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, with trust and empathy and solidarity, wouldn't be in favor of research and development, et cetera. Of course they would. Now, would they work, uh, there's, a, there's a related criticism that comes, this is a criticism that comes from economists. This one will amuse you. They say, wait a minute, there's no pressure to accumulate. That's a, very, a variant on this. M Marx said, accumulate, accumulate, that's Moses and the prophets for capitalists. In other words, market systems have a pressure to accumulate. And they say, participatory economics doesn't have that pressure. The only pressure to accumulate in participatory economics or to innovate is that people want it. But it isn't structurally built in. So they say people won't work as many hours. And they say that's a criticism. Right? And I just sort of, like you, smile and laugh. And I say, yeah, that's right. It is highly probable that in a good economy, when people have control over their own lives and they assess the relative value of leisure and work, they will want to work fewer hours than now, especially when we eliminate, you know, all of the way, when we eliminate military production. When we eliminate, there, there's about seven million homeless people. I think that's the number. I could have the number wrong. And seven million empty hotel rooms every night in the United States. Just think about that. What the hell does that mean? There, there. What about advertising? So you get rid of all of that, right? And you get rid of the unequal distribution and you ask, how many hours a week would people likely be working in a good economy? I don't know the answer, 20. A good guess, right? 15, maybe. I suspect more because I think people will like it. That is, productive labor is a part of human fulfillment. And so I, I would imagine 20 or 25 hours, not because merely of the desire for the product, but actually because of the desire for the productive activity. And it's way in the, someplace in the back, yeah. Whatever. Um, I just want to come back to, to the, the question somebody asked earlier about money. And uh, I was a little disconcerted by the way it seemed like you sort of dismissed the, the money issue and then said something about how, you know, the key, the key isn't to talk about money, but it's to talk about social relationships. And, and I think money, like a technology, is certainly shaped by social relations, but we can't underestimate the way in which it shapes social relations. You know, universal currency 
seems to have a tendency for accumulation and hierarchy built into it in some sense. If and what we mean by currency, let's just clarify terms, okay? Suppose we mean by currency something that earns interest, something that's capital. That's one way of looking at it. Suppose we mean just something that facilitates exchange, something that allows I have shoes, you have hats, and you have oranges, right? And, and I want what you've got, you want what he got, and he got what I got, and it's hard to trade the stuff all around. So we use this universal, as you say, this universal equivalent that somehow allows us to, to manipulate, you know, to move the stuff. Right? Then all it is is an index. It's just a place kipper, right? The same way as on an index. On a, I don't want to go into this in detail, but it's the difference between those two things. The pernicious aspects of money have to be dealt with, right? But the pernicious aspects of money are really pernicious aspects of capital, pernicious aspects of the distribution of money, of the distribution of income, of remuneration, right? These are the real pernicious aspects. The, the, the simple facilitating of exchange is not pernicious. Anyway, that's the point. You still I mean, deal with the form and function of the currency and how it's exchanged and how it works. I mean, sorry, what? You still have to deal with the form and function of the currency and how it works. I mean, I'm thinking of the difference between a universal dollar and a local currency, you know, which, which you know, may be used as an economic organizing tool. Well, and but you're talking about under this system, not under a, a good economy, right? There's no which is two very different things. And I don't think we should spend a whole lot of time on local currency, but it, I think a lot of the impetus and the desires behind people who work with local currencies is good, but I think a lot of many of the implementations of it are probably bad. Um, in many places, I suspect local currencies are mechanisms that allow employers to dodge um, um, health care concerns and, and you know, other concerns like that, to escape not the worst part of the economy, but the best part of the economy and that desperate people put up with it. So there are good sides and bad sides. The good sides we have to learn from, the bad sides we have to overcome. But that's not the issue of what it would be in a good economy. Yeah, you always have to make a distinction between, and it's hard, not, it's hard to do it, between thinking about a part in the current situation as compared to thinking about an alter a different situation. Because in the current situation, a part is, doesn't make a lot of sense sometimes. right? You understand what I'm saying? It, it, it all makes sense as a whole system. A half a bridge is useless. Right? A half a bridge only gets you into the lake. Right? You, you need the whole thing. So you have to first understand the system as a whole, or any system as a whole, and then see if elements of it can be incorporated in the present as, as a part of a process of going forward. There are innovations that we can do around money now that would be positive. Right? But money is, is it's capital that's a big issue or the monopolization of information and knowledge that's a big issue, or the maldistribution of assets, or the maldistribution of access to, to goods and plenty, or the maldistribution of circumstances. Those are all the big issue, and, and money just is a, is a part of that. You compared it to technology at one point. Um, I think that's a mistake, too. I don't know whether you're making a mistake, but a lot of anarchists do make a mistake. They think technology is bad. That's like reform is bad. You know, that's, that's just a horrible confusion. This is technology. A pencil is technology. Everything that is a human artifact is technology. If technology is bad, we should become worms. You know, we should stop using our minds. Bad technology is bad. That's true. Bad technology, you know, um, uh, uh, electric shock machines to kill people, that's bad. Assembly lines, bad. Nuclear bombs, bad. All sorts of bad technology. But what makes the technology bad is not that it's technology, a human artifact, but that it is its purpose and its construction and its conception and its, and its implementation have bad effects. It's a mistake to say technology is bad. It is right to say bad technology is bad. But then you have to ask, well, wait, why is there good and bad technology? What are the structural factors which cause some technology to come out horrible and some technology to come out at least benign or maybe even good? And then you're behind the scene once again into institutional structures and social relations, which is where we should be, you know, where we should be focused. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask a question about uh, non-reformist reforms. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom's side of the family is from Appalachia. It's like a historical hotbed of union activity. And on the one hand, uh, there have been uh, labor unions that are kind of, uh, you know, uh, looking toward the big picture, like the United Mine Workers when they started up. 
had a program more or less like uh, the revolutionary syndicalism. And on the other hand, they kind of have you know traditional business unions. So I just wanted to know uh, what what you would uh, suggest uh, as a strategy for uh, working with labor unions. You know, should you try to create alternatives like the IWW, or to you know try to bore within, or you know? I don't know. That is to say, I think that that both of those, I I can envision the emergence of rank and file workers' movements. Right. around lots of things from globalization, from those kinds of issues to workplace issues, that would be a fantastic thing. I can envision the emergence of rank and file council structures. That to me seems necessary. So the emergence of workers beginning to, to coalesce together and to say, this is, our, this is our council. This is the embryo of what we want in the future. And we're going to try and start to develop programs and stuff out of this vehicle that brings us, it's like a union except it's councils, it's local. You know, it's for control over the workplace. I can see unions as a part of it. But what makes something a reform or a non-reformist form is very, reform is very rarely um, the actual content of the thing. It's rather how it's talked about and what you do about it. So, for instance, increasing wages. Right? It's neither reformist nor non-reformist in and of itself. It could be either. So you can talk about increasing wages in a way which legitimates corporations, which legitimates markets, which legitimates capitalism, well, you can talk about it in a way which is you know, oriented towards some other aims, let's say participatory economics. And you can fight for it in a way which is fighting for the wage gain and that's it. Or you can fight for it in a way which is fighting to create structures, to create movement organization and infrastructure which will win the wage gain and then use the higher wages to win still more. That's what non-reformist is as compared to reformist. Yeah, my question was, uh, given that we're trying to do the non-reformist reform, should we try to like create an alternative? Uh, Both. I try to, you know, it'd be like much easier to do it if we created an alternative, but there's all these business unions already in place. Like, well, but it's it's both. I mean, it's the same question. It's really, it, it's honestly the same question: is should we work in General Motors or create South End Press? And we noticed when we look at that that well, South End Press is nice, but General Motors is huge. Right? And the same thing goes here. Should we create a, a, an alternative labor institution or should we work in the unions? Well, the question becomes, you know, how much progress can we make in the unions? I don't know the answer to that. If we could make fantastic progress in the unions immediately, we shouldn't even bother with creating anything else because we could turn them into something really po- If we make slow progress there, then we probably need the other, both to win gains and to provide something for the people in the unions to look at to see what it is we're trying to accomplish. You see? The answer is probably both. Yeah, uh, I think I kind of came to anarchism sort of from Marxism. um, And when I started to analyze, because that's what I was first exposed to, um, I started to look at it and I came up with some critiques, which, you know, the authoritarianism was a big thing. And then um, another theory that, that I came in contact with a little later, a lot later, um, which I'm more familiar with as kind of a revolutionary program is libertarian municipalism. That's had a lot of influence on me. That's something that Murray Bookchin has written a lot about. Um, And then I I started to come up with this other critique of of Marxism, uh, which is what, what I think is economic reductionism, seeing us as merely economic entities as workers, or as in a lot of campaigns, think of us right now as consumers. And it sounded, and that, that's something that is also, I think, a problem in syndicalism, um, is that it sees, it, it, it deals with the authoritarianism question a lot, but it still is only looking at us in the economic sphere and not in the political sphere. Um, to varying degrees, you know, in, in, I guess in the personal sphere, but I think the political sphere is one that in particularly is ignored. And when I think of like a directly democratic workplace, um, it seems like it can't just be that workplace or a confederation of workplaces. It seems to me that, um, and this is something that I'm really getting from libertarian municipalism, is it needs to be accountable to a community, to a municipality. Um, and that's something I kind of wanted to, to pose. I mean, isn't there a danger that a uh, collective workplace would kind of 
turn into some kind of like collective mini capitalist endeavor if it doesn't have that accountability to the community. With all the things that you raised, one of the things was economism. I think that's horrible. Right? I mean, my, my critique of Marxism is partly economism, partly elevating economics to this primary position and, and viewing everything else in terms of it, which I think is a big mistake, um, but it's partly getting the economy wrong. That is to say, even in the sphere that they pay most attention to, I think they get class analysis wrong. So they see capitalists, they see workers, they don't see the coordinator class. I think there's a reason they don't see the coordinator class. I think it's, you know, Marx taught us to look at a theory and ask not what it says about itself, but who it serves. I think Marxism is the theory of the coordinator class, not the working class. That's why Marxist revolutions put the coordinator class into the ruling position. So that's my big critique, if you will, of Marx. That doesn't mean that everything that Marx says is wrong, by no means. Just like everything that Milton Friedman says isn't wrong, right? And Marx is a whole lot better than Milton Friedman, right? But that's the, um, so I agree with you about economism. Um, I agree with you about needing a political vision. I just don't think libertarian municipalism is a political vision. I honestly don't, in the following sense. Um, what would a politi what, what did I say an economic vision is? Well, we have to figure out what the economic functions are, production, allocation, con consumption, and we have to figure out alternative institutions for accomplishing them. Okay, so what's a political vision? Well, we'd have to figure out what are the political functions, and then what are the institutions that are going to accomplish them? Libertarian municipalism pays attention to, I think peculiarly, but it pays attention to legislation at some level. In other words, somehow getting out of a populace, it's, it's, its desires in the form of programs and legislation. But it doesn't pay attention to adjudication. It doesn't pay attention to disputes. It doesn't pay, pay attention to a police function. It doesn't pay, attention to, doesn't pay attention to a great many things that are part of politics, meaning polity, the state, you know, the, or polity in the good sense. So I have problems with it on those scores. I think it is, I hate to say this, but there's no point in you know, mincing words. I think it's ridiculous when it talks about the economy. Um, libertarian municipalism. It's just the people who did it should have stuck to politics, which they understand and they have some understanding of. But when they start talking about economy, it's embarrassing it, to me when I read it. Um, and I've debated with them and talked about that, trying to be a little more gentle than I just was. Um, but, but it really is. I mean, it, it's just because there's no conception of what it means to talk about allocation, to talk about things exchanging at the proper rates, ri arriving where they need to be, right? And, and of having a system that, that manages that and gives people appropriate say. Now your real question. Could, in a participatory economy, each workplace become callous toward the people in the vicinity? Or cal well, in the sense of, in other words, you said it had to be subject to, or at least influenced by, appropriately, the will of the people in the municipal, in other words, in its surroundings. Right? Well, that's what it means. In other words, if it's not subject to that, it might do things that hurt those people. Right? It might do things that hurt those people. On a larger scale, it might do things Take a, take a different scale. Suppose we, suppose we, suppose workers, and, or even workers and consumers, right? In other words, workers and people who are living in the neighborhoods in Michigan decide to put in some kind of new um, electrical thing, right? That will improve the situation in Michigan, but the prevailing winds are such that it will create a whole lot of pollution in Chicago. That's serious, right? In other words, it should be the case in a good economy that the situation of those people in Chicago is a part of the calculation and is a part of the decision. They should have a part of the say. So it's not only that if we're a workplace, the people outside our door should have a say in whether or not we have a little open pipe that leads into their backyard dumping pollution, right? which they should. right? But it's also the case that if we and they want something that will benefit us and them, but it will drop shit in Chicago, the people in Chicago should have a say. So it's an even bigger problem than you raise. And, the, and it, it, it's exactly the case. This is the hard part of economics. It's exactly the case that we shouldn't slide it under the door and solve the problem by having either an authoritarian ruler who just decides right, or by having markets that simply exclude all of this and have the profit decide. Right. We should have an allocation system which does what? Which apportions appropriate say over this decision to the people affected by it. That's exactly what participatory economics does. Now, if it doesn't do that, if somebody shows me, if a libertarian municipalist shows me that it doesn't do that, right, I have to renounce it. That's what I'm claiming it does. But no libertarian municipalist, no straight economist, nobody right, has even bothered to make an argument that it doesn't do that. Right? And there's a good reason. It's because it does do that. But, but, um, so if you were right that, that a workplace would dump 
or would just ignore, or, would, or the people in the neighborhood would be excluded from impacting its decision, then it would be a problem. And my people who aren't familiar with libertarian municipalism, the problem with libertarian municipalism is they say, okay, the people in the, municipal, in the, in the neighborhood should have a say. And then they say, well, we'll have the, the polity of the neighborhood decide what goes on in the workplace. Well, notice what that does. It gives the people in the neighborhood total or certainly huge say over what goes on in the workplace, which largely affects the people in the workplace. It errs in the opposite direction. It doesn't solve the problem. It, tra- it, it reverses the problem. Right? It gives the working people too little say over their circumstances. Right? Not appropriate say. Saying that they're going to influence their circumstances by virtue of being over here in the city, in the polity, having one vote among all the city people. Just think for a minute that if we're a working place. Does it make sense that your say in what we do in our workplace right, is one-nth of the population of the whole city, which is what libertarian municipalism says? Or does it make sense that it is whatever it should be within our 50 or 100 or 1,000 person workplace and that the workplaces, you see the difference, and that the workplaces say and the cities say are appropriate with respect to things that affect the city or things that affect Chicago. Now, I can't do the details, but you, you see how I'm not ignoring the, what, what the libertarian municipalists are saying. I'm taking it very, very seriously. So seriously that I think that what they're saying is a critique of their vision, right? Because their vision does ignore it and violates it, right? And that I need to, and if, I, and if somebody can show me that we're not abiding that, then we've screwed up. We have to go back to the drawing board. One little quick thing of clarification is I, I think there are some people within like libertarian municipalist politics who are seeing this this issue that the workplace should be also a an entity that has primary decision making over itself. And, and I mean I I'm actually new to that theory as well, so I mean there's a lot of stuff to But then there's no problem. About. In other words, if if what libertarian municipalism come becomes is a political vision a vision for how people should work together with appropriate input into norms that, that guide our political life and into how we deal with when there are disputes. If all we say is that there will be no disputes, therefore we don't have to deal with them, that's crap. There will be disputes, right? There will be big disputes. There will be instances where you need to deal with violence, right? Whether it's you know, some, somebody who goes berserk or whether it's a serial killer, or whether it's somebody who gets drunk and is rowdy, right? how do you deal with that in a way that's consistent with our values rather than violating them? Right? So if they develop a political vision, that's great. And if participatory economics is great, they should be compatible. Yeah. And I think they would be. I should hope so. Yeah. Mike, we have a different kind of problem. Somebody. Mike, Mike. Hmm? you need somewhere else? Right we got to get out of here? Yeah. OK. I need to. OK. Oh, because I have to do that thing. Oh, I, I have to stop. I have an appointment to do something else. So.